I have started the recording. I have uh, okay the annotations. बहुत ऑसम बिना कैडबरी पार्टिसिपेंट्स प्लीज म्यूट योर ऑडियोज हेलो हेलो Uh, Vinny, ma'am, uh, will you be sharing the presentation?
okay so uh, let us begin good evening participants um, sorry for this delay i tried out something new of uh, live streaming it through uh, a customized uh, channel but maybe i have to do some more experiments on that so now to begin with i would request dr susama samuel our principal to start with a few encouraging words ma'am Ma'am, you're there. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, manager of yeah, manager of our institute, Father uh, Blaise de Sousa, uh, esteemed resource persons and all participants. A warm welcome yes, from Saint Xavier's Institute of Education to this mathematics webinar series on strategies and solutions for boosting mathematics learning this webinar series uh, is an initiative of mathematics pedagogy unit of our institute under faculty in charge dr ini sebastian associate professor and uh, her team of mathematics students the objective of this uh, webinar uh, is to boost mathematics education uh, that is uh, mathematics teaching as well as, well as uh, mathematics learning considering the significance of mathematics as a subject as well as uh, the other side the mental block and uh, uh, mathematics phobia of our students uh, towards this subject and how to overcome it and uh, how to develop interest in mathematics teaching and learning today uh, we have uh, two eminent personalities from learning tata institute of fundamental research dr k subrabhanyam sir and dr shweta naik madam i welcome both personalities towards uh, this webinar dr, dr. subrabhanyam sir is going to speak on on a, a prerequisite for constructive teaching listening to students thinking and dr shweta madam, madam will share, share with, us with us homi baba center for science education mathematics activities for enrichment and professional development of teachers it is going to be a double treat today and today is all about mathematics all the best to resource persons and enjoyable and enriching session to all participants over to dr vini thank you ma'am participants you all are please requested to keep your mics muted so that we can have a smooth program unfortunately <laughs> not uh, this uh, program because we tried to join in and uh, he was not able to join in uh, so i'm just addressing him in absentia respected father blaze bisuza manager dr sosama samuel our principal sxi colleagues our esteemed resource persons sxi students and our dear participants for today's mathematics webinar series 2 on strategies and solutions for boosting mathematics learning I trust and pray that all of you are safe during this pandemic. We are truly humbled by the huge response for this webinar series. This series was started with the hope that SXI, through its mathematics pedagogy unit, could bring some positive changes in mathematics teaching learning at all levels of education. Just um, spoken by Dr. Sosama Samuel. we are so happy with the valuable feedback given to us by our participants for our last webinar in order to see the changes happening through these webinars and also to learn from the participants experience we request the participants to share your innovations with us through a one minute video which we with your permission will upload on your on our youtube channel mathematics learning channel for the benefit of all those who are interested in mathematics teaching learning this initiative must not turn into a routine monthly activity so we urge our participants to write your thoughts regarding mathematics teaching learning 
on our email id sximathwebinar@gmail.com we sincere i sincerely thank our resource persons for today and our student coordinators riesel and alsona who are also our co-hosts for this evening and also rachel and claris welcome all once again for this webinar we've already uh, wasted some time so without much uh, delay i request alsona to introduce our first speaker of the day dr subramanian thank you vani ma'am good evening everyone we are honored to have with us dr k subramanian as a resource person for today dr k subramanian is professor and center director of the homi bhabha center for science education tata institute of fundamental research in mumbai india sir so sir main area of work for the last two decades through research and teacher professional development workshops is the improvement of the learning and teaching of school mathematics sir so completed his btech in aeronautical engineering in 1984 from indian institute of technology madras thereafter sir completed his masters in philosophy in 1995 from university of bombay sir has also completed his phd in philosophy in 1992 from indian institute of technology bombay sir has diligently worked to develop curricular and co curricular teaching materials teacher training and teaching students mathematics at school level sir has also conducted research in domain of cognitive aspects of mathematics learning mental representations in reasoning and problem solving through his lectures exhibitions and books including some on history of science and mathematics sir has tried for popularization of science and mathematics sir has given his valuable contribution to develop various resources for teachers like training manuals real life geometrical examples a video module on assessment in the maths classroom covering the topics of teaching a mathematical procedure explaining a concept using teaching aids teaching through questioning etc sir has also contributed in various books journals proceedings expository writings internal and technical reports and the list goes on dr subramanian was also part of our sxi college internal quality assurance cell and we truly acknowledge sir's contribution in enhancing the quality of our programs we are extremely honored to have such an experienced resource person with us today once again we heartily welcome you sir thank you uh, very much should i start now i uh, guess sir you may start with your session thank you for those nice words and uh, the kind introduction also na and uh, thank you so much to dr sebastian dr samuel for the disaster for giving me this opportunity to uh, be with all of you today it's a great uh, pleasure and an honor uh, to be here and this is something talking to teachers uh, student teachers even students and so on is something that i really enjoy of course i wish uh, we could have all been in the beautiful campus of uh, st javier's college uh, face to face and sharing the same space Uh, but uh, these are unusual and uh, strange times so at least we are able to meet online and uh, have a chat uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, i'm going to really look i'm looking for i was looking forward to this and i am uh, uh, i'm sure all of you will also uh, enjoy this uh, evening with a talk by me and dr shweta naik so uh, before i start i just like to uh, say that uh, please feel free to ask questions uh, if we were in the same room i would have seen you all uh, raising your hand or seen the expressions on your faces i'd have been able to uh, adjust what i am saying but now i can't do that uh, you know we are all only on the screen so i request the student coordinators alsana others to let me know if there's please interrupt me if there's any question you think uh, we need to address at the end that's also fine 
but don't please don't hesitate if something needs to be clarified i'm quite happy to do that uh, right away so uh, <clears throat> let me begin my uh, talk Okay, uh, can you all see my uh, screen? Yes, and you can yes, hear sir. me also. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah, yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Do I need to speak more loudly, or am I audible and clear? No, sir. You're audible and clear. Okay. Thank you. So that's uh, the title of my talk, and uh, a prerequisite for constructivist teaching is uh, listening to students thinking. Uh, of course, I'm not sure if you can see the entire screen. Maybe you can do some adjustments so that you can. Uh, see the screen without uh, the videos uh, interfering. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, listening to students thinking. Uh, and that's really the essence of uh, what we call constructivist teaching or re responsive teaching or student-centered th teaching. All of these mean more or less the same things. And it's not teaching where you pre-plan, there is a pre a uh, scripted lesson which you come and deliver and the students can either take it or leave it. Uh, it's not of that sort. It is rather something in which you're adapting and uh, uh, listening to students and responding to them and thereby supporting their learning. And on the whole, this is a much more effective way of uh, uh, teaching. So that's what we will talk about. And I'll be drawing on our experiences in research and uh, you know, uh, classroom teaching and learning on our own experiences, also on some of the literature, which is available. And uh, uh, of course, it's not particularly tailored to our current situation, where I think many of you are doing online teaching, keeping contact with the students over the distance and so on. But some of the same things do apply. Uh, listening to students thinking is important in any context. And uh, some of these will also apply there, although they, it's mainly drawn from the experiences of regular uh, classroom teaching. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> this is an overview of my talk. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I'll spend right. time talking about what I mean by thinking. And uh, uh, that will be my first example. This example won't be from uh, mathematics, it's from uh, our daily experience. Uh, you could say uh, maybe related to science. Uh, the, <clears throat> then I will talk about uh, do, so I'll ask this question, do students think in the classroom? And I'll give an example of what I think is uh, uh, an example of students thinking and uh, what is involved in noticing such uh, thinking. So uh, in particular, I'll talk about the sort of knowledge that uh, teachers need in order to notice students' uh, mathematical thinking in the classroom. Then I'll talk about, uh, you know, students uh, also make a lot of errors. Now, does that mean that they're not thinking when they make these mistakes, they're not paying attention? Not necessary. Sometimes thinking, uh, good thinking can also lead children to make what we consider errors, uh, different from standard mathematics. And that's actually productive and helpful in teaching and learning. And so uh, I'm going to also look at that example. Uh, that will be my third example. The third example is on, uh, has to do with the uh, topic of measuring length. My second example is on decimal numbers, and the first example is from our uh, uh, daily astronomical experience. And of course, I'll uh, end the talk by uh, uh, saying a little more and depending on the time. Okay, so that's my first uh, theme or first question, what is thinking? And I'd like to begin by uh, uh, giving an example. Uh, so just to check, am I still audible? And can you see the screen? Yes, yes sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yeah. So uh, in between, I'll also ask, uh, request Dr. Sebastian to launch the polls. I hope you are ready with this polls. Yes, yes, sure, sir. Okay. So here is a picture. I hope all of you can see the picture. What can you see in the picture? Can you see the moon? It's the crescent moon. And uh, typically you see it in the evening or in the morning, just above the horizon. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there it is. So this is one picture of the crescent moon, picture one. And this is another picture, picture two. Now, uh, I have a question for you. And the question is, uh, which is closer to what we actually see? So that's your poll one. 
uh, which picture, picture one or picture two, is actually closer to. So let me show those. Uh, uh, I think let me drag this whole window to one side, and uh, so you can do that also. Let me show you again uh, picture one. Sorry, picture one and picture two. And uh, so which picture is closer to what you actually see? So I'm giving you about 30 seconds to select one. So picture one is closer to what we see, and picture two is closer to what we see. So can you see the results? Yes, I can see the results. I suppose that's the final result. And 71% uh, have uh, picked uh, picture one. That's very, very interesting. And 29% have picked uh, picture two. So, <clears throat> so what's really the case? So now if you see, it's actually what you see from Mumbai and from Maharashtra and from most of India, or rather the tropical latitudes, is actually closer to picture two. And uh, yes. So it's a bit like this. Maybe it's a bit inclined, but more closer to that horizontal thing than the moon standing up. But we all remember, you know, pictures we have seen of uh, fairy tales or Chanda Mama or whatever. And then uh, I think even in movies. So you remember uh, the moon sort of standing up, which is not the case in the tropical latitudes. Yes, it's like that when you go to the higher latitudes, when you go to Europe, Northern Europe and so on, it'll be much more like that. And why is that? And that's the reason why I gave this example, because it has something to do with uh, a, a historical fact uh, from the history of science. And it's really fascinating. Because if you look at the moon, the crescent moon, and if you draw that arrow, which sort of goes through the center, through the middle of that shape, pointing outward, that is on the curved face of the moon, and you draw that arrow, you will see that arrow points to the position of the sun in the sky. So of course you can't see the sun because the sun is just set. But the arrow exactly shows the actual position of the sky, uh, of the sun, just below the horizon. And uh, this is something, this is always the case. So when you take the crescent moon, the half moon, what's called the gibbous moon, which is more than half, if you take the outer curve, the convex curved surface and draw an arrow through the center of it, it will always point to the position of the sun in the sky. And uh, that's fascinating. And that's something that you don't usually notice. And uh, in the tropical latitudes, of course, the sun is oriented like that. But in the northern latitudes, the sun follows a more angled path, and which is why the moon is more tilted towards the vertical. Of course, we don't observe that. And what we observe, in fact, what people have observed from ancient times is the dramatic change in shape of the moon. How is it that the moon changes, which is so prominent in the sky, changes shape from being a thin crescent to a half moon to three quarters to full? And this happens just over a few days. And it's um, quite mysterious. And uh, people uh, thought of all sorts of explanations for them. Uh, many people thought that somebody is eating the moon and then spitting it out. Uh, of course, many people think that it's, uh, those who have learned a bit of astronomy, modern astronomy, think that it's the shadow of the earth which is falling on the moon, which is also not quite correct. It's not the shadow of the earth, which is correct during the lunar eclipse, but during the, the change in shape of the moon, which we call the phases of the moon, is simply because a part of the moon is lit by the sun and it's not turned towards us. We are watching the moon from a side or from the back or more from the back. And so we can only see a part of the surface of the moon, which is lit by the sun. And that's really what the arrow shows. Because the sun is lighting from that direction and the moon is turned away towards the sun. The sun is much further away. And so it's uh, facing. So you can say that the bright side of the moon is actually facing the sun. And this is always true. We never notice it, of course. But somebody did notice it. And this was a Greek a philosopher in Athens. At least that's the record we have. Maybe many others noticed it, including in India. But this is what is recorded, that a philosopher in Athens called Anaxagoras, around 400 BC, noticed this. And he said that, why is it that the moon's face, the bright face of the moon, is always pointing in the direction of the sun? He wondered about it. And he came up with a simple explanation. He says it's because the moon shines by the reflected light of the sun. And that explained completely 
why the moon actually changes shape from day to day. So you can imagine that something that you cannot quite see, but uh, through the imagination you arrive at uh, the correct explanation. I think I, I really like this example. I think it's a brilliant example of thinking. And uh, so let's look at what elements of thinking are involved in this example. One is observing, noticing a pattern. Of course, we won't observe if you're not curious. And the nice thing is that children, students, and so on are naturally curious. So they're always looking, uh, observing things, noticing, uh, wondering, and so on. And so this is also likely to happen uh, uh, in our classrooms, and uh, we should encourage it. So one part of thinking is just observing, and what drives that is curiosity. But observing alone is not enough. It's to describe the pattern, to precisely capture what it is that you're observing. Because once you capture the pattern, you articulate it through language. Now that helps enormously in uh, carrying forward the process of thinking. So articulating. So we articulate it by saying that the bright face of the moon is always pointed in the direction of the sun. Of course, then you ask, imagine what might explain this? You know, this is a very peculiar pattern. It is a strange pattern. But is there something which will explain it in a very simple way? And yes, it's simply explained by saying that the moon just shines by reflection. Uh, and so, of course, imagining alone is not enough. You must check the facts. You must check uh, every day, the next day, and so on. Uh, and see if the uh, what you've thought of, your hypothesis or your explanation of the phenomenon, is correct or wrong, and you test it. So this is a part of uh, coming up with the explanation and checking the explanation, both of which we could say is reasoning. So thinking has all of these elements, and let me again summarize those. Uh, so there is an element of curiosity. Uh, there's articulation or speaking it out in language. There's some imagination involved in coming up with an explanation, coming up with a model which uh, uh, you know, removes the mystery uh, surrounding a phenomenon. And then, of course, imagination can run quite wild. You must check your imagination by reasoning and uh, seeing whether uh, what you have come up with is actually uh, holds true or not by checking it with facts, by more observations, or perhaps doing, more, uh, doing some experiments and so on. Of course, I have not uh, outlined everything or described everything that uh, is involved in thinking. It is not a philosophical essay. Uh, there are many other aspects to thinking, asking a question, probing for unstated assumptions, examining the concepts one uses, many things that one could say further. But for our purposes for today, uh, this is really enough. And uh, <clears throat> let me continue. Okay, so this is a question that I uh, ask now. Do students think in the classroom? Uh, maybe I should have put this in the poll, uh, but feel free to express yourself in the chat room what your views are on uh, whether students think in the classroom and what your own experience has been and so on. Okay. Uh, so this is an example uh, that I have from the classroom. Okay. Uh, this is an example from a class a lesson for class six taught by a teacher in uh, one of the schools. Uh, in Mumbai. And uh, this example is taken from the work of Shikha Tucker, who is uh, my PhD student, and I am thankful to her. Uh, it's indeed a lovely example, and uh, both of us, I think, have learned quite a bit by uh, reflecting on this example. So here is, uh, the lesson is on decimal numbers, and the teacher is explaining what a decimal number is. And that's the example she has on the board, and she has written uh, 683.12 on the board, uh, which is indeed a decimal number. And uh, she's beginning by explaining that the decimal number has place values which are more than or different from whole numbers. And I hope you can see my mouse. <clears throat> uh, so uh, she's saying that, okay, you have the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, and this is the whole number part. And you have the decimal part, and you have the tenths place. So there's a tenths here and the tenths, and she emphasizes the difference in pronunciation, the difference in uh, spelling. 
so the tens and the tens and you have the hundreds here and the hundreds so you could say uh, so so she's making this correspondence and then uh, she's explaining and introducing the students to this uh, place value in decimal numbers of course the students are very curious and uh, they are thinking in the classroom and do you have any idea what uh, the students might ask <clears throat> something pops up in the students mind and uh, so let's see what the students ask uh, so there's a students question and actually this lesson was observed over two years uh, two consecutive years and in both the years uh, the students asked the same question it's very interesting so what happened in year one so as soon as the student introduces this place values and says tens tens hundreds and hundreds and so on uh, one student asks what about ones or one x and uh, another student says uh, one x nahi hota chal <clears throat> and the teacher appears to ignore and moves ahead so this is the question asked by the student uh, interestingly in year 2 you have a similar episode uh, another so exactly the same introduction is done by the teacher and the stu one student asks ma'am one it's kyu nahi hota hai and this time the teacher is uh, responding in a very different way and uh, she uh, poses the question back to the class so this is called revoicing in uh, in uh, some writings so the teacher revoices what the student says it's one of the techniques of getting children to discuss and to present someone's thinking uh, so the teacher says nikita is asking why is one it's not there another student says ma'am hota hai uh, once one it's hota hai and then there's a discussion on why one it's not there. so uh, this is a very interesting question and uh, it's something worth uh, thinking about for us it's Uh, not just an example of students thinking but it's also an opportunity for us to think what exactly is going on in the students mind why they ask this question now the interesting thing that i'd like to tell you is that uh, shikha my student she observed about eight lessons and in about six out of these eight lessons actually this question cropped up so it seems to be a very common question it's also something that we have read about in the literature it's reported by others so the interesting question is why this question is asked and uh, why does this crop <clears throat> so once again to just recall the question this hundreds tens ones tens and hundreds and the students question is why is there no uh, distinct place for one x why is one x missing and our question is uh, 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 why are the students asking this and is it important to respond in detail okay now here is poll 2 and this is for you uh, to respond i hope you can still hear me and you can see the poll so are there one it's in a decimal now so uh, you can click so are there one it's or are there no one it's 30 seconds we will click hmm i think this is taking a little more time it's all right you can take a risk uh, there's no harm okay so no and somebody says yes that's very very interesting because uh, in some sense i think both of these are correct and so that's uh, really interesting so let's see uh, what actually happens <clears throat> so why are there no ones this is uh, what the students are actually asking now in order for the teacher to deal with the students question uh, firstly i must say that uh, the teacher must notice what the students are saying now in order to even notice what the students are saying one must have some inkling of what the students are thinking so it's important to sort of see behind what the students say and get a window into the students mind and the students thinking and that requires some specialized knowledge on the part of the teacher and uh, this has been written about in the literature many of you may be familiar with this phrase called pedagogy content yes excuse me uh, yeah. 
sir um when when you are talking on the screen no the participants are uh, drawing some lines it's called annotating so yes. sir you need to disable the annotations on your screen because i have disabled since your screen sharing i see disable so sir on top right you can see more if you click on more uh, right. there will be a drop down okay so uh on the top top right sir so you can see more is only my screen so let me try to ah uh, you have to stop sharing sir first you stop okay. sharing okay i'll stop sharing all right okay. so then uh, i go to uh, so on the right sir on top there is more there is more is it okay so let me so sir you have to disable the annotations because i have constantly put up messages on the chat but the participants are still uh, annotating okay so uh, let me see more yes there is more yes. and disable uh, participant annotations attendee annotations okay i don't think i have that with me so uh, okay so uh, participants please refrain from annotating on the screen while the session is on so you can continue okay all right so let okay, me share the screen okay okay so uh, we are back and uh, can you hear me yes sir okay so uh, i was saying so how do we notice the students question uh, how do we make use of it in the teaching and how do we respond to this so all of this requires a particular kind of knowledge uh, which is uh, specialized knowledge that teachers should have so a little bit of my talk is also about this specialized knowledge some of you may be familiar with this term called pedagogical content knowledge which is uh, the sort of knowledge that teachers need to have which is their own professional knowledge so even if you're teaching mathematics uh, of course you need to know the content you need to know pedagogical techniques etc but there's something which is an amalgam which is a a uh, sort of combination of content and pedagogy which is about mathematics and about pedagogy and that's what's called pedagogical content knowledge so you could say my talk is also about uh, pedagogical content knowledge which is actually essential to uh, do responsive teaching or constructive teaching okay so what is this knowledge so this knowledge is partly about the way students think and partly about mathematics all right so now uh, let me talk to you about both those parts and remember that the question that the students are asking is why are there no banets in the decimal number in the place values okay so here is a picture and you can see that what the teacher did when she presented this decimal number 683.12 is to talk about the place value she said ones and then she said tens and just like there are tens there are tens to the right of the decimal place and just like there are hundreds there are uh, hundreds to the right of the decimal place so she's setting up a kind of correspondence between tens and tens uh, between hundreds and hundreds and you can see that what is implicitly cropping up is something like a mirror a mirror metaphor uh, you could say and this mirror metaphor is immediately absorbed and noticed by the students and uh, so they make sense of it and of course i mean so the question crops up that there is ones here and there's a mirror here so there must be a ones and so this is a legitimate question and so this is part of uh, what you could say the analysis of thinking it's the mirror metaphor which is cropping up and which is inducing the students to uh, for uh, inducing this question to pop up in their minds however Uh, in order to respond to this you also need to know a little bit of the mathematics of uh, decimal numbers and here is something uh, quite interesting and uh, it also is an example of why mathematics is uh, gives you deep insight and it's uh, can be very insightful very powerful tools to explain concepts so let me show you something of the mathematics now if you look at the mathematics you will see that uh i uh, i have used a device here that is to use what we call the exponential notation to uh represent all these place values i think many of you will be familiar with the exponential notation for example tens is written 10 is written as 10 to the power 
that is the place value of this place. Hundreds is written as 10 to the power two, which is the place value of this one. Uh, thousand is written as 10 to the power three, which is the place value of this uh, position here. Now, when you go to the right, uh, you have uh, the tenths, which is one by 10, one over 10, which is written in exponential notation as 10 to the power minus one. And the hundredths is written as 10 to the power minus two. And the thousandth is written as 10 to the power minus three. And now you see that actually the mirror, the location of the mirror is not at the point, decimal point, but it is at the units place. It's at the ones because once is written as 10 to the power zero. So that's really the center and that's the focus. Every other place refers back to this position, this place value or the units place. And so the notion of unit is actually very important. So when we talk about, you know, so many meters, so many uh, centimeters, etc., it's this place value which actually denotes that unit and it's the units place. Every other place makes a reference so now let's see of uh, the place much more clear. I think some of you need to mute uh, unless you want to ask a question. If somebody needs to ask a question, uh, otherwise I request others to mute. Uh, so we have here uh, uh, the location of the mirrors actually at the units place. And then you see that there's the tens and the tens, and there's the hundreds, and so the symmetry is nicely preserved, and uh, the mathematics of it actually reveals what uh, is the place of the symmetry. The, the decimal point, therefore, has no mathematical significance. It's merely to a convention to show which is the unit's place. It's just to the right of the unit's place, and that indicates which digit is actually uh, sitting in the unit's place. That's, uh, you could even put the dot on top of the unit uh, it wouldn't really make a difference. Of course, in some languages, you know that uh, the dot, dot is replaced with a comma. Okay, so now <clears throat> uh, I don't want to stop here. This is an analysis of the kind of knowledge that the teacher needs uh, to notice a student's thinking and to respond to it. But of course, we, how to respond to it uh, can bring in some other elements of knowledge. And I want to uh, take you to that. Uh, because also to what exactly, what actually happened in that particular lesson and how the student, how the teacher dealt with uh, students' questions. Now, as I mentioned, the teacher did not deal with the student's question in the first year. Uh, in the second year, the teacher revoiced the question, posted back to the students. And the students had their own ways of explaining why there are no ones. And this is very interesting. Of course, I'll refer you to a paper. I don't think uh, I put the reference there, but you can do a Google search. And uh, this is a paper jointly written by Shikha Tucker and me. And you can refer that paper for details. But uh, this is roughly what happened. So that uh, one student said, uh, ma'am, suppose there is a one its place, actually, it would be the same as seven upon one. <clears throat> and that's a very interesting argument. So let me explain what the student said and what the teacher actually accepted. And uh, all the students uh, did accept that as a common uh, sort of argument that people agreed on. So what the teacher did that let's, let's assume there is one, one its place. And suppose the digit seven is sitting and occupying that one its place. Now you know that this is sitting in the tenths place. So one is sitting in the tenths place, which means one upon 10 or one over 10. It's the fraction one by 10. Uh, two is sitting in the hundredths place, which is the fraction two by hundred or two hundredths. Uh, so two upon 100. So in the same way, we should write seven as seven by one or seven upon one. Now you see that seven upon one is not actually a fraction, but a whole number. So since it's a whole number, it cannot appear to the right of the decimal place, it should appear to the left. And in fact, seven by one is the same as seven ones or seven units. And so there's no one its place because it's the same as the one its is the same as the ones. And uh, this is very interesting, the argument. And I think it uh, connects many things. It connects the decimal uh, place values with the fraction notation, which is actually quite powerful. It tells you that one and ones and one its are the same. And that's why we don't have a separate uh, term like one its. And that once is actually the place of symmetry because it's 
uh, what all the other place values are referring to. So this is a, a interesting thing, and I think quite a lot of thinking is going on in just asking this question, answering it, and dealing with this uh, example. So I hope that you are convinced in some way uh, about uh, uh, you know that there are many instances where uh, students are actually thinking in the classroom and uh, uh, giving attention to that, responding to that can make the class uh, very exciting. Of course, you can recall the elements of thinking. There's some imagination. There's some observation, noticing a pattern, articulating the pattern, coming up with an explanation, some reasoning. All of those elements are there. Yeah, in this thinking. Okay, now let me go to the next part of my talk, uh, which is my next example, uh, which is, uh, see, students make uh, errors or they come up with what we call misconceptions or alternative conceptions. They're different from our standard mathematics. They're different from uh, uh, what we believe mathematically to be correct. And so we call them errors. And uh, this is uh, something worth pondering on, uh, pondering over, uh, because why is it that students make errors? Does it mean that they don't think, they don't apply their minds? Uh, they are not, uh, you know, they somehow have uh, spaced out and so on. And it's, uh, in fact, often, not always, but often it's the case that uh, students are actually thinking, and it's this very thinking and a kind of creative process uh, that uh, leads them to make or to develop or different from the standard conceptions and standard ideas. That's why they're called alternative concepts. And this is something very, uh, very much at the heart of uh, constructivist uh, theories of learning, that the students actually actively construct their own concepts and conceptions based on their experiences. It's to account for their experience. And that can lead to concepts which are different from the standard concepts. And Sometimes it can lead to what we call errors. And uh, this is an interesting example. And uh, so let's look at this. And <clears throat> uh, the example is measurement of length uh, using a scale. It's a, one, it's a rather simple concept. It's one of the simplest uh, measurement concepts. And children learn it fairly early. And uh, so we're going to look closely at uh, students' uh, responses and even students' errors in measuring length and try to understand students' thinking. Uh, this is the example, and this example is taken from uh, a study by uh, Educational Initiatives, which is an educational organization. You can read more about it on the web. And uh, this is a question which they asked to many, many students. And uh, you can see the picture there. And there's a scale, there's a pencil which, uh, whose length is uh, to be measured with the scale. And you can see it right next to the scale. And of course, the answer is uh, clear to you. You can see that. Uh, the length of the pencil is actually five centimeter. But the question posed to the uh, students is, what is the length of the pencil? Is it four centimeter, five centimeter, six or seven? And now I'm going to ask this question to you, not to ask you what is the correct answer, which you all know, but to guess what young students, these are actually students of class four, uh, so very young, what young students are most likely to choose as the answer to this question? So that is your next poll. So you have an option. You can click on uh, what you think. So what, is, uh, what do you think is the most likely choice that young students will make out of these four options? 30 seconds. So I hope you can see the picture and you can see those numbers and uh, the options. Okay, so uh, very interesting. So I think this is, uh, we really have a, a very interesting audience today. And uh, many of you have guessed that the young students will choose seven centimeters. And I must uh, compliment uh, you on that. And many others have also guessed the other uh, responses. Okay, so let's look at what the actual responses are. And here is, uh, a distribution of the percentage. Uh, as you can see, seven centimeter was the most common option. The correct option was only chosen by about 15 
I think it's almost mirroring the results of our poll, uh, poll uh, Dr. Sebastian. I think you have a wonderful audience today. Okay. And uh, they've uh, almost guessed exactly. So, uh, of course, some have chosen six centimeters and uh, very few have chosen uh, option A, which is four centimeter. Now, it's interesting for you and then it's interesting exercise for you to think about why students might be choosing these options and what is, their, what is the reasoning behind these uh, uh, choices. Of course, uh, <clears throat> so why do students make these errors? Can we learn something from them? Now, uh, let me say a little bit about uh, you see, uh, length measurement, as I mentioned, is a very simple concept and uh, students learn about it uh, quite early. And many of you may be thinking, why are we making a big deal about this? Because about errors in measurement, because anyway, as students grow older, we are talking about very young students. By the time they come to class six, class eight, they're much older. They'll not be making any more uh, errors. So why do we bother about this? So we can just proceed. Uh, these errors will go away and let's not worry about these errors too much. Now, that's uh, a fair point of view, uh, but I'd like to share something interesting in response to that uh, doubt you might have. And uh, that is this uh, graph, which is taken from the same study. And uh, there's also a paper, the reference to that paper is given there. And uh, let me walk you through this graph. So I told you that the question was shown to class four students. But the same question was also posed to class six students as well as class eight students. So three different uh, groups of students. The numbers are very large. 1,500 students, 1,800 and 1,500 here. Very big numbers. So the statistically robust uh, results, you can really uh, you know, believe in these results. And I'd also like to tell you that these students are from elite schools. They're actually from what were identified by most principals and so on in uh, large metro cities, Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Calcutta, Chennai, and so on, as in Bangalore, as the leading schools, the most reputed schools, and uh, the English medium schools. And uh, this was a question given as part of test to all those uh, school students. And here are the results. Uh, class four students, uh, the green is the correct answer, which is five centimeter, and it's going up. Class four, uh, class six is nearly uh, 40%. And class eight is over 60%, which is very good. We should all feel happy. Uh, the students are doing very well, no problem. They're getting all the answers correct. And the seven centimeter, which you all guessed young students will choose. Yes, that is going down rapidly. Uh, from 40%, it's come down to 20% in class six and gone down to something like 5% in class, five, uh, class eight, which is very good, uh, as one would expect, nothing to worry. But I'd like to call your attention to this middle one, which is six centimeters, which is incorrect. Of course, it's not uh, correct. But this error seems to be persistent. It's not going down with age. And you can see that it's uh, remaining more or less constant, goes up slightly. You know, so it's about, it's over 30%. So the question is, why is it that over 30% of uh, class eight students even uh, choose this incorrect answer of six centimeters. And I'm going to uh, <clears throat> now uh, uh, show you a video a clip of students sort of responding to this question. And it's very interesting. Of course, the video is also taken from educational initiatives. It's linked to the study. And it's available on YouTube. Uh, I, uh, the education initiatives as a channel, you can find it. And I have, uh, it's reproduced here with uh, permission. So now let me uh, show you this video clip. And so I'm going to stop sharing the screen here uh, and uh, go to uh, uh, share the other one, which is the video. Here we are. Um, share it. And uh, I hope you can see the slide. And uh, can you see the picture of the pencil and the slide? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. So I'm going to start playing the video. I hope you will all be able to hear the audio. Uh, okay. So let me uh, just pause and take you back a little bit to that example. And, uh, and just call your attention. Uh, you see here, 
Uh, this example, of course, the pencil is again, the correct answer is five centimeter, which is fine. But the position is a little different from our earlier example. The pencil was placed at two, from two and it went up to seven. But here the position is at one and it's going up to six, which is a slightly, so the options are slightly different, doesn't matter. Uh, the ideas and the questions are the same. So don't worry too much about that difference. So now let's listen to the video clip. And as you can uh, see that uh, majority of the students actually chose the correct answer. The pencil point is on C, six centimeter. That's why I think it is C, the correct answer. That will you show the screen here? I hope you can only hear the audio. Yes, sir. So I think that it will be six centimeter. I just pausing it. Uh, can you see and hear the clip? Yes, yes, sir. We can. Okay, thank you. Uh, there, there is one centimeter here, one centimeter here, and one uh, one centimeter here, one cent and one centimeter here, and one centimeter here. If we uh, add all these, then the answer will come five. Well, actually, it is five centimeter, but uh, it is uh, holding wrong. Uh, it should start from zero, so uh, so it becomes five centimeter. Kids okay, start learning how to use the ruler, how to measure length with a ruler. Now, uh, when we tested class four children on this concept of uh, measuring measuring length with a ruler. We essentially found two kinds of misconceptions. The first one is something that we had kind of foreseen, and maybe even you know some teachers might uh, foresee, and that is instead of one centimeter, the starting and the ending point of a object while measuring. Kids see only the ending point. So, if the if an object ends at say nine here, they consider the length of this object to be nine centimeters or nine units, rather than seeing you know from here to here what that length is. This point is touching to the nine. That's why it should be D nine centimeters. Yes. The pencil is showing six centimeters because the six centimeters the point till the point six centimeters is matching that one. Okay. Starting from here, mm -hmm. so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This four will count as one, and from nine it will be six. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. We will not see how much it, the, there is. It starts from six because it starts from four, four, one, one. One, two, three, four, five, six. M is here and the answer is six because it's starting from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. We said the ending point is here. So, so the second kind of misconception is when they have trouble actually understanding what is it that has to be counted. What is the nature of the parts that have to be. Okay, I'm going to counted. skip this a bit because I think you have all got the point. You've seen what the students were answering. And uh, so, okay. So let me go back to the slides, I think. And it's very interesting. Maybe I'll just show you a 
couple of minutes more. Or, okay. So here is another interesting part of the video, which is worth seeing. So let's watch that. What is one centimeter? So is this point one centimeter or is this much one centimeter or is this much one centimeter? I think this point is, this to this is one centimeter. This to this is one centimeter. Yeah. And this to this? That is zero centimeter. This is zero centimeter. How much is this, uh, this to this? Two centimeters. Okay, so this much is two centimeter? No, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, how much is this? Five centimeters. Only this much is five centimeters? Or you're counting from all the way? From your tail. But the pencil doesn't start from there. But still, these markings means this is one centimeter, this is two centimeter, this is three centimeter. It ends up till six, so I feel it's six. Okay, so you're saying that because it ends with six centimeters, it must be six centimeters. Yeah. Okay, fine. So, Tommy, what is one centimeter on the scale? So this one. You put in two fingers. So how much exactly? Okay, so you're saying this line to this line. That is one centimeter? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. The child counts it as one, two, three. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing because we don't have a lot of time. And uh, go back to my slides. Uh, Dr. Sebastian, can I take about five minutes more? Uh, yes, sir. Is that okay? Okay, so we started a bit late. So let me just take... Uh, okay, so <clears throat> I think you saw that uh, video and you got a sense of what is really happening, why the students are thinking. They're very confident in the video, uh, but they're thinking very differently from the way we adults think. And uh, let me just dwell a bit on one of the questions. You saw uh, two or three different kinds of thinking, but I'm just going to pick one. So, which is that some students were counting marks instead of inputs. And I'm going to ask you the question. Now, if you're actually equally spaced marks on a scale like this, uh, would it not work in order to measure length? Because they're equally spaced, and we can always measure length by just counting how many marks, so to speak, uh, fit into that length. And uh, what would happen? What, would, uh, what if we adopted this new system? Uh, we can actually work with this new system. And uh, so here is the conventional system uh, by which this pencil's length would be five centimeter. But in the new system where we are counting the marks, uh, it would be six centimeter. So similarly, if you had a length of 12 centimeter, it would be 13 centimeter. If you had 25 centimeter, it would come out as 26, so apologies for the spelling mistakes, 26 centimeter. So we have a new uh, system of measurement, but actually it seems to work. I mean, why can't uh, comparison of lengths would still work? So mathematically speaking, order is preserved. So here is the next poll. So would you therefore say that, uh, would you accept counting marks instead of counting intervals in order to measure length? So what do you think? Can we uh, adopt this system? Because so many student uh, uh, children are spontaneously or naturally arriving. At so can we have this poll? I'm very curious uh, to see what you would say. Okay, so uh, I hope uh, people have uh, clicked. Uh, maybe they're still thinking. So there are the results of the poll. Okay, so that's very interesting. So we have a divided house uh, with just a small slender majority like in uh, some of our states. Uh, so <clears throat> that's okay. So that's also very interesting to me. And uh, let me uh, so uh, just go back to the previous slide. 
so that uh, <clears throat> so you have actually uh, that we know saw that we can compare lens the bigger lens would still be bigger in the new system the smaller lens would be smaller so order is preserved so we would be able to order lens however what about addition of lens now you know that 5 cm plus 6 cm should give you 11 cm now 11 cm in the new system will correspond to 12 cm but if you did the addition in the new system entirely so 5 is actually 6 and 6 is actually 7 so if you added them you would get 13 cm and not 12 cm so you see that actually addition of lens doesn't work and you can think about multiplication of length by a number a uh, multiplication of two lengths to give area uh, division of a length by a number in because you're partitioning a length uh, into equal parts and so on and think about whether all of these would work and uh, you would see that actually in the new system uh, these things would not work so which is one reason why we adopt uh, the system that we do which is actually we are counting the intervals and not the marks uh, that fill up a particular length so we learned something about measurement by reflecting on why students make particular errors and uh, that uh, one is important thing is that the measurement system that we adopt uh, the conventional one versus the new one which one do we choose it should work not only for comparison but also for operations uh, such as addition subtraction multiplication etc and uh, these are very important in measurement because these correspond to the actual real life operations of joining Uh, which is addition replicating uh, which is like multiplication making multiple copies uh, partitioning which is to divide a length into equal parts and so on so all of these should map on to operations we do with numbers which is the calculations that we do uh, through a simple relation and it shouldn't be too complicated so that's my second example and i think i should stop here uh, uh, of course i would have liked to do a third example which is of the example of division Uh, which is very fascinating because it's there in the NCERT textbook. But I'll just point you to uh, uh, a reference uh, which you can look up, and uh, it's a fascinating uh, case of uh, students thinking and using students thinking in uh, teaching in the classroom. So uh, <clears throat> uh, let me stop there. Uh, those are the acknowledgments. Uh, uh, thanks to all my colleagues in the mathematics education group at HPCSC. i acknowledge the support of uh, government of india and of this project and the atomic energy uh, department uh, which is the parent organization for tifr <clears throat> which is the uh, rather the funding organization and uh, thank you and that's our website you're welcome to visit it uh, apologies for taking longer and uh, now we are opening open to questions so let me stop the sharing <clears throat> so um, thank you sir for uh, that uh, talk of yours and uh, i would request uh, clarice to pick up the questions and also na if you can help her okay uh, ma'am i'll take it uh, so yeah. so yes ma'am so sir so we'll begin with a question and answer sessions that the student have asked on zoom and youtube so sir so the first question is how will you teach mathematics to a child of 6th grade who is a special child in terms of understanding simple concepts like addition and subtraction and also area of perimeter now uh, that's uh, like a huge question uh, i think uh, even if i had the expertise i'm sure one cannot answer this question in uh, a short time so i just like to point to a lot of work which has been done not by me but by many others Uh, on working with uh, special children uh, just recently a student of mine uh, completed his dissertation rossi bistuza on teaching mathematics to uh, the visually disabled uh, i'd invite you to he has also published and written papers please to refer to them i'm sorry i can't answer in more detail because this is like a really involved thing it's very important question and uh, i just like to point uh, elsewhere Uh, so let me skip a bit rachel any more okay. yeah no ma'am that's all uh, only some student wanted the third example but 
uh, due to we don't have that much of amount of time so we would not be able to take that exam okay, just let me so check sir for two minutes ma'am let me check one ha uh, ma'am uh, there's one question which uh, application you, you used to test the poll one can you repeat can i ask one question yes ma'am i think someone is trying to ask question so yes. you mute yourself and ask question yeah yeah okay okay so uh, how did we do the poll i think that's the question and actually the expert here is uh, dr sebastian i just took a help uh, she set up the poll uh, dr sebastian i think it's a feature of zoom so would you like to say uh, something very briefly uh, yes uh, okay uh, this is not related to the webinar i i, I think you can uh, go on the zoom website and understand about the poll So if anyone wants to know, you all can text me uh, after the webinar. I can explain. Rachel, any more questions, please? Yes, ma'am. A last one. How could estimation of division be taught in a easier way? Okay. Uh, again, I'd uh, uh, refer you to this paper which uh, uh, splashed, and I'm sure it will be there on the YouTube uh, recording, which will uh, hopefully work and be made available. uh so it's very important uh, for students learning mathematics to learn it in a meaningful manner and uh, one of the important things to do to allow this is to connect uh, your teaching your problems and so on with actual contexts so division is most uh, easily and uh, best connected uh, whole number division uh, to the context of equal sharing so if you got equal sharing situations and interpret division in terms of equal sharing uh, then that gives students some idea of uh, how to estimate uh, if you say you know 600 rupees uh, or 648 rupees shared among uh, four students how much would each get they would know at least that each one gets more than 100 or more than 150 rupees and so that would give them an uh, ability to us uh, estimate so i think it's very important and i have written also quite a bit about this to look at the meaning of mathematical operations to connect them to actual context and to present these uh, to students so that they can uh, they're not just uh, uh, you know working with symbols they're not juggling symbols but they're connecting these symbols to actual meanings quantities in the real world and thereby they're making sense uh, so that would be uh, very helpful in arriving at estimation of course estimation itself can be strengthened in many ways uh, through exercises on estimation and uh, but the most important thing is to connect to meaningful contexts sir i have a doubt this uh, yes, yeah it's not a question it's just a uh, clarification from your side sir what it means to be a mathematical thinker uh, uh, is mathematics thinking different from thinking in uh, other subjects because um curiosity observation imagination uh, etc are needed for uh, is it a requisite for uh, learning other subjects or solving problems in other subjects so um, for solving mathematics problems the students use a particular style or a particular fashion or they are uh, they are using a procedural knowledge to solve the problem that's really an excellent question and i think uh, it's something that but thank you for asking that because i think i should have also addressed that in the talk so i talked about elements of thinking taking an example from outside of mathematics uh, from science and so your question is very legitimate so is it what is it that uh, distinguishes mathematical thinking from other kinds of thinking and uh, yes so uh, mathematics one uh, way of describing mathematics is that it's the science of patterns so you look at uh, many many examples and you try to see what is common to them at an abstract level so at the level of just patterns so this is one way of describing it and it does probably doesn't make uh, too much sense unless i give an example uh, for example you could take uh, rubik's cube uh, and you see that the mathematics of the rubik's cube is something related to uh, what is called groups in algebra and uh, it's a very abstract idea but it's underlies it explains uh, the you know the pattern underlying rubik's cube and how uh, the cube gets solved and many other things which are similar to the rubik's cube and so on. so this is uh, one aspect which is special to mathematics which is to 
which is a kind of abstraction by looking at the patterns and by generalizing the patterns. So these are key words. Generalizing, abstraction, uh, uh, these are key words. The other part of mathematics is uh, the reasoning which is involved. The reasoning which is involved in mathematics is slightly different from the reasoning in science or in other subjects where you actually do experiments, carry out further observation, test your hypothesis or your conjecture. In mathematics, that is necessary to some extent. You have to test your conjecture by looking at examples and so on, but that's not enough because you must arrive at something called proof. So proving is uh, something special to mathematics, a deductive proof. So you begin with what are called axioms and definitions and you reason with them till you establish something to be completely true on the assuming that the axioms and definitions are uh, true. So this is uh, uh, special to mathematics. So proofs, I think, uh, so this, uh, I hope it gives you some bit of an answer, but it's uh, probably uh, needs more explanation. Thank you for that question. So I have a question. Yes, sir. When you saw the, the errors that students are making, I was really surprised at the way each student, the, the students who were making the errors, how they were looking at the same problem. So, uh, sir, can you give some uh, tips, uh, you know, how uh, the school or the teachers can minimize these errors in the students? Why are they looking at it so differently? Like, it's just the length of the pension, but they didn't even know how to measure. So, what do you think the teachers should do to eliminate these kind of errors in students? Yeah, that's a good question and it probably requires a long answer. So, the answer that I tried to give in this talk is a very preliminary but essential step. So let me just repeat that. So uh, as you noticed, children think, it's not that they don't think, and they think very differently from adults. And I think, you know, we are surprised at the way that they think. And you see with such confidence that they are actually expressing themselves. And this is really what uh, constructivism means and constructivist teaching is pointing to. That the first step, is to listen to the students' thinking, you know, which we miss most of the time. And in order to listen to the thinking, we have to elicit, to bring that thinking to the surface. And we can bring that thinking to the surface through questioning, you know, through probing, like the person was doing in that video. So you actually try to see what is going on in the student's mind. You first get an idea of it by looking at the pattern of responses that the students have. And then you probe a little more. And when you come to understand, you also try to See, what is the rationale? What is the justification behind that thinking? Which is what I tried to do. I'm not sure whether it's successful. That even counting marks has some justification. Uh, but that's not what we do in mathematics. And why is it that we don't do it? So I think teachers need to understand certain choices we have made in mathematics. We're not counting marks, but counting intervals, because it's important for doing operations with measurements, not just comparing uh, lengths, but operating with lengths. So once you're armed with this kind of knowledge, with this power and capacity to notice, now you're ready to begin teaching, which can actually help students to uh, go forward in their thinking, to align with more standard ways of uh, mathematics, to probe, maybe come up with mathematics of their own. So, but that, how to do that, I think we need more uh, discussion on pedagogy. And so that maybe we can take up another time. So I think, sir, we need to have a part two of your session because we were really curious to know what you're going to show about division also. So, sure. Uh, sure. Sir, you, to to time, you will make time for us for one more session, sir, so that we can have some good time with you discussing about the other operations also. Sure. So, uh, so thank you, sir, very much for your valuable time. Uh, over to yes. Sona for the, sorry, Clarice is going to introduce our next speaker. We have Dr. Shweta with us, who will be talking to us about uh, the activities of the Homi Baba Center for Science Education. So, uh, Gladys, I invite you to introduce, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Very fortunate to introduce our second uh, speaker for the day, Dr. Shweta Nayak. Dr. Shweta Nayak is currently working with Mathematics Education Group at Homi Baba Center for Science Education, Mumbai, and was adjunct faculty position with the University of Northern Colorado for the year 2018-19. Ma'am has received a PhD in Mathematics Education from the University of Michigan, USA. 
masters in mathematics from pune university and bachelors in mathematics from mumbai university dr nayak has diverse teaching and professional experience and has worked with educational institutions and various boards like cbsc zit st xavier's institute of education university of michigan tata institute of social sciences etc ma'am has taught at many levels and pedagogy of mathematics to masters and phd students ma'am has also been one of the active resource for teacher education at hbcsc and has been focusing on teachers mathematical knowledge required for teaching that facilitates access to mathematics and learning with understanding ma'am has won a lot of awards and scholarships and is the writer of numerous books and journals ma'am has done a remarkable work in teacher education and experience in mathematics words and time will fall short to tell everything about what incredible work ma'am has done we are pleased and grateful to have you ma'am with us today thank you thank you thank you claris welcome ma'am thank you uh, actually i feel little bad because the discussion with the case presentation subramanian sir was going on very well yeah. and i see many of the people have commented for sir to continue so <laughs> sorry about that sir so uh, i told sir that we need one more session yeah yeah Good. and i think it's challenging to have that kind of a session in an interactive mode so i think it went very well so yeah, yeah i also enjoyed it how much time i have vinny ma'am now yeah 15 20 minutes ma'am okay. is it enough okay yeah so i'll i'll share my screen yes can you all see uh... yes yes ma'am Okay, I can't do the full screen view. Full screen view. Okay. Hello, can everyone see me and hear me? Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. We can. Yes, ma'am. so uh, i am actually not going to talk about uh, much of any ideas or anything uh, i am going to talk about some of the activities that the homi baba center for science education does specifically the math education group uh, professor subramanyam is the director of the center and uh, the center has uh, many sections uh, design and technology science education other talent nurture program and i am going to talk only about the math education uh, primary reason for this is uh, that i'm i'm it's very exciting to talk to many of you in such mode uh, to be with you in like a same space uh, not physical space but some sort of an interactive space uh, so i don't know whether in pandemic also we could figure out some sort of collaborations uh, and uh, post pandemic too so i'm just going to explain you some of the things that we do so uh, this is sort of the things that i'm going to talk about that what we have in math education uh, uh just make note of two things that this is the work of many uh, people who have been part of math education group and are part of the math education group right now uh, that is one thing and secondly all that uh, is i'm going to show you in today's slides is available on our various websites so towards the end i will post links for all of them in one slide and you can take a screenshot so that you will have all the links what i will try to do today is i'll try to tell you what sort of things uh, you can get engaged with us uh, or, or what sort of things you can look at our website and in future uh, whether we can do any collaborations so okay i will move on uh, i'll talk about math laboratory first so maths laboratory is sort of a space that we have at the center uh, here is one picture from one sort of a view it's a small room accommodates 30 people but we have kept it uh, on purpose a small room where students or teachers sit talk and explore uh, 
so it's a place to explore uh, some mathematical ideas through games and puzzles uh, there are many uh, ideas when you say maths laboratory there are many other uh, ideas that uh, come to people's mind and many other people are doing something called maths lab but we do not do something which is for like a, a like a assessment or it's a similar to practical of maths where you get some marks from practical and some marks from theory so uh, this is what we we think that this space is more about uh, uh, trying to explore do some discovery uh, things like that and the materials that maths lab has uh, can be used by students as well as by teachers uh, it is very difficult for me to show you uh, all the materials uh, in this session yeah so i what i'm going to do is i'm just going to give you a glimpse of one of the activities uh, Uh, from a maths laboratory so can you see all of you can you see the square hello no ma'am we just can see the first screen oh the first slide yes now we can yes ma'am now we can see so let me not do the full screen so let me go back yeah so these are the five things i am going to uh, six uh, yeah five things i am going to talk about and uh, the first is math laboratory i think the full screen doesn't show you so i'm not going to do the full screen this is a picture of math laboratory uh can you see the picture now yes ma'am okay great i'm glad i asked <laughs> mm -hmm. uh and this is uh, the room i mentioned it's a small room for 30 people uh and this is what i said about math lab that it's not for assessment but it's more for uh a, making interest in bringing interest in students doing games and puzzles and exploring discovering new things so just to give you an idea i'm going to give you an example and i am not going to uh, like explain this but just leave it as a brain teaser for all of you some of you actually might know about this so all of you can see the square and uh, what is the area of the square everybody knows that uh, can somebody just say what is the area of the square Sixty-four. <laughs> yeah, it's sixty-four square units. Uh, ignore the red lines for a moment and just look at the figure. So it is sixty-four square units. And uh, like, if you see in the uh, like a corner, the red lines that I have shown. If you cut at those lines and rearrange that square, we got this new rectangle. And the rectangle has uh, dimensions now. Thirteen by five. So, what is the new area of this figure? Uh, is actually sixty-five square units. Is that right? Mm. Yeah. So, what we just did was we took a square which has area sixty-four square units, and we now have a rectangle with some cuts which gives you sixty-five square units. So, the question is, can area be changed by cutting? By can area be increased or decreased when you cut something and rearrange it? Uh, if you have not lost any paper or not lost any. Paper. so does this make sense so when we do this with students and teachers we ask them uh, to figure out what is actually happening uh, with students it is very interesting because some of the students actually think that when you cut the paper and put it far away the area is increased so for them they think that the area is increased because we cut the paper now there are more number of pieces so there needs to be a different kind of discussion with students uh of course why this happened uh, you all might be thinking that what is the what is the reason behind this so there are two ways to look at it i'm not going to give you a uh, answer but i'm just going to tell you the ways in which you can look at it one way is uh, you can uh, actually make this square make this cuts and try to rearrange this and see what is happening uh, the second way is you have the dimensions in a way for each of the uh, triangle form number 1 and 2 and each of the quadrilateral form which is number 3 and 4 so you could actually calculate the slope for the sides which are uh, coming on top of each other and see what is happening there mathematically so yes but the uh, i'm not going to tell you that why this area is increased uh, for that i think here, if you visit our website and i will show you how to do that you will find uh, what's the explanation for this but the point is these are the kind of activities that we have and we have roughly 55 to 60 right now uh, in a written form uh, on the website and they are in both english and marathi language 
the second component that uh, i said is teacher professional development uh, so we do engage in teacher professional development uh, at in service and pre service level so uh, so we do in house uh, workshops uh, for professional development or we do collaboration with other institutes uh, what we have done in the past have focused on content knowledge for teaching so uh, there are there was uh, example of that in uh, professor subramanian's talk today that what does it mean to know mathematics for teacher so uh, in short when one says that i know the i know how to do the multiplication is a, is a content knowledge of multiplication but i know what kind of uh, different answer students will give for for a multiplication problem and how to talk about those alternative answers or their systematic errors is a content knowledge for teaching so that is a very specialized knowledge that only teachers that is our professional knowledge that only we need to have so we have been focusing on that for uh, in many of our workshops uh, we have done topic wise uh, discussion of those uh, we also want to focus on we have worked on how can we learn from our own teaching because when we become a teacher in in service the time is such a big issue that how can we develop some noticing learning things that we can learn from our own teaching that has been also our focus we love to do problem solving in mathematics in fact with saint xavier's one of the batch we have done problem solving in maths with students uh, and then there have been other talks about policy how to understand educational theories so this has been the focus for tpd with the uh, teachers we have been also working with teacher educators uh, mostly in collaborations with diet and scrt and Uh, we there we try to focus that what they can notice from the teaching, uh, what are the forms of different lesson study, its enactment, uh, and what is a mathematical knowledge for teaching. What what should you look for when you talk to teacher or uh, when you observe a classroom, things like that. Uh, we also have something called teacher fellowship, which I think would interest many of you. Uh, it is uh, where group of teachers or teacher can come and work with us. Uh, and teachers can actually develop activities they can come up with their own questions like uh, i i was teaching this and student responded this and i want to know how to have this particular trajectory of say trigonometry or how to teach uh, ratios and we could work out things together we could actually access what we already have so that kind of fellowship is possible and of course we did we do some uh, courses for pre service teachers for b ed colleges uh i have written hpcc certificate course there which is a plan it's not uh, it it doesn't exist yet but it has been a plan and hopefully it will happen sometime uh, we do courses on pedagogy of mathematics uh, problem solving in math understanding education theories and understanding worldwide research uh, especially the one uh, especially research that has impacted uh, teaching and teacher knowledge sort of uh, then there is uh, we also engage ourselves in math education research uh, like case used uh, example from shikha's work shikha is one of the math education researcher uh, and she almost finished her she has finished her phd uh, so we do uh, student camps various student camps in summer uh, and winter vacations uh, we haven't done in recent times because of various reasons but we have used the summer camps to explore various teaching strategies to understand Uh, what is students mathematics uh, and i particularly like this word that there is a mathematics as a discipline and then now we are calling some mathematics for teaching and there is a student math that we need to uncover so we sometimes to interviews we talk in length with students uh, we also develop worksheet teaching sequences and textbooks the pictures are shown for the primary textbooks here you will find more worksheets on our website which i uh, give you the link at the end. we also do uh, research in teaching where we collaborate with teachers in a sense that we so you can see in this picture one of my colleague tuba is recording the class and i am sitting in another uh, beside her and may taking some notes and uh, we are observing teaching so we try to develop some tools for classroom analysis create video episodes and this is something i think teachers uh, should take more interest into even though it looks little uh, foreign in the sense but i think this is where you can uh, take a like a big classroom and actually zoom in and see your teaching in a very micro form to understand some some of its components some of the things that are happening which are very difficult to observe them when you are standing in front of 55 students and teaching 
So this is something uh, we do research in. And uh, yeah, if people want to join, collaborate, there are possibilities to do that. Uh, then I'll talk about Vigyan Pratibha units. Uh, sorry, I'm just running very fast because I know people have uh, people might have other uh, commitments. So Vigyan Pratibha is a project recently started two years back, and uh, it is uh, uh, focused at grade eight and grade nine. But what has uh, come, uh, what has what has been developed in this uh, Vigyan Pratibha units is very. Uh, specific units in mathematics which sort of bridges the gap of school mathematics with something that might go in advanced mathematics. Not exactly advanced mathematics, but some of the practices that you need to do in, uh, you, you need to do advanced mathematics. For example, when Case was talking about proving. So what sort of things you need when you try to prove something? What it means to do mathematics? Like in science, you have to take observations. But what is what are some core practices in mathematics? So I think they have been focusing uh, on uh, some of the practices and uh, there are very uh, interesting units available for free. There are detailed units uh, for grade eight and nine. And uh, there is a possibility for you to collaboratively teach and design these units there. So uh, that is another uh, option. They have also developed something called learning bytes. Uh, I think I don't have time to show the video, but what they have is uh, mini videos of mathematics teaching, something that actually teachers can do on their mobile. And uh, the videos are mathematics, uh, about sometime mathematics, which has an implication to instruction. Uh, and here also you have possibility for a collaboration. Uh, I think Winnie Ma'am uh, in the beginning when she said about this one minute videos, I thought it's a very fascinating idea. And I actually think that you can capture really good things in even in one minute. Uh, so I, I will be looking forward to that YouTube channel, what videos you all send. But uh, in Learning Byte also you have a possibility for a collaboration, creating videos, creating content. Uh, then lastly, I, this is a new association that uh, it's not part of HBCSE, but it's an affiliated sort of a thing. Uh, many of us part of Mathematics Teachers Association. You can become a member and be part of these activities. Right now, there is not much of the activity happening in the uh, Maths Teachers Association. Other than they have a bulletin, we have a bulletin uh, which comes sort of a once five to six months. But the thing is, uh, this association has an integrated sort of a uh, membership. So you have teachers from college, you have teachers from school, you have primary teachers. So uh, when uh, we had one conference uh, within this uh, association, it was very interesting kind of a dialogue. So for that purpose, I think it's a, it's a good platform uh, to join in and be part of the activities. So this is the slide which I mentioned that you should take a screenshot of. The first link is the Homi Baba Center's link. The second link is uh, Mathematics Education, HBCC link. Third link is where you will find all the learning units that I mentioned for grade eight and nine. And the videos that I mentioned, mini videos that you'll find on uh, Vigyan Pratibha. And the last one is the Teachers Association. The second link, Math Edu HPCSE, has again many uh, subparts into it. Uh, the link will look like this. When you open the, uh, the website will look like this. Uh, and there will be many other uh, uh, things that you can access. So you can access some of the videos of teaching. Uh, you will have access to posters that we have designed. You will have access to all the mathematics laboratory uh, activities. Uh, you'll have access to books. So more, we have been following that whatever we have been creating, we are uh, making it available in an open access mode. Uh, maybe we are a little bit uh, behind in uploading everything, but most of the things are there. Uh, this is sort of a team uh, and you'll find this is some part of the team. Of course, there are many teachers and other people who have been with us. You'll find more details about each of them uh, at the website, this website that I just showed you. Okay. Uh, now, I just want to make a, a suggestion that if you have anything, any of this activity, you feel like it matches with your wavelength, you want to explore more, uh, you can write to us. Uh, my only suggestion would be before writing uh, to any of this email ID, uh, I would suggest that you please visit these websites, explore them very well, 
because see it is very overwhelming that if you have a general interest so its processing is difficult i think if you can find out something very specific that is useful for you suitable for you and maybe possible in pandemic post pandemic then please write to us so that is all i have uh, thank you very much i think i finished uh, fast so yes. that should save some time uh, and yes i want to thank you vinny ma'am uh, just to have this experience of uh, uh, meeting so many people at the same time and thank you saint xavier's thank you ma'am it's a pleasure so how do i stop sharing yeah yes ma'am on top yes yeah so ma'am uh, i think you know due to lack of time i'm not taking up any questions you have already given the email id and also they can contact you and definitely our institution will definitely collaborate with you and uh, we'll see next year how we can take it from here thank you very much for presenting all the activities ma'am thank you uh, so i request uh, resel now to propose the vote of thanks resel Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, on behalf of Saint Xavier's Institute of Education, Manager Father Blaise De Souza, Principal Dr. Susama Samuel, and Mathematics Pedagogy Staff in Charge, Dr. Vinnie Sebastian, I would like to extend a heartfelt thanks to our resource person, Dr. Subramaniam, who has enlightened us all with an amazing session today on the topic. a prerequisite for constructive teaching is listening to students thinking thank you sir for accepting our invitation for this webinar readily and we are really grateful to you for sharing your knowledge and thoughts with us today i am sure that all our participants have gained some amazing insights on how to improve mathematics teaching as it is rightly said teaching is a listening profession so you have made us realize how important it is to listen to students thinking in order to find out the root cause of misconception that students might have in their mind regarding various concepts in mathematics right from explaining various examples to showing an actual demo conducted in classroom you have made this session so interesting that everyone wanted to hear more I would also like to thank Dr. Shweta Naik for letting us know about various activities conducted by Mathematics Department of Homi Baba Center for Science Education for enrichment and development of teachers and students. In the sub session, Ma'am has elaborated various activities that are really beneficial for students and teachers both for developing a profound understanding. of mathematical knowledge required for teaching finding places for students ideas and making mathematics learning more practical and fun i am sure that many students teachers and institutions at large would be interested to participate and experience this workshop so thank you once again to both the resource persons for today we couldn't have asked for more better ones next I would specially like to thank and appreciate our staff in charge of Mathematics Pedagogy Unit, Dr. Vinny Sebastian, for coming up with this wonderful idea of having an online math webinar series in this current COVID situation. Thank you, ma'am, for your support and encouragement. My heartfelt gratitude to our student coordinators, Ms. Alsona Gomes, Ms. Rizal Gonzalez. Ms Clarice Lemos and Ms Rachel Carvalho for being the strong team behind the curtain and providing technical support arranging an online platform for such a large audience was made successful by the hard work put in by each and every one and last but not the least a big thank you to all the participants for your presence without each and every one of you on zoom and youtube this event wouldn't be successful we hope that you are taking back something with you from this today's session and that you will make use of it in your respective field so once again thank you for making this event successful with your enthusiastic participation 
with this i end my vote of thanks okay so uh, alsona can you give some instructions regarding the feedback also uh, yes ma'am i will continue yeah reason yeah so uh, participants a few instructions regarding your certificates firstly note that submitting the feedback form is compulsory in order to receive your e certificate feedback links will be posted in the whatsapp group soon after this session ends also remember that the links will be active for just 1 hour that is um, up to 7 pm as informed earlier kindly fill the feedback form with correct details as no changes in name would be done later your certificate will be mailed to you within 30 minutes after submitting the feedback form in case of any queries regarding certificates not received please write to us within 1 hour beyond which no doubts would be considered thank you so much thank you everyone i'm signing off for the day and see you for the next webinar series and please remember to send your one minute video we are waiting to receive the video and share the innovative ideas with you thank you everyone bye thank you ma'am so i'm ending the meeting for all yes ma'am